Namaskar. Hello and welcome to Kri Guru's channel. I'm your host, Sri Ayer. Joining me, General Ravi Shankar, and we're going to be talking about an Iran post Raizi. What exactly is the. I beg your pardon. I have uh, the app running on my phone also. Um, post Raisi, what is the changes that one can expect from Iran? Or is it going to be same old, same old? And to understand the geopolitical implications of what happened last week, um, General Ravishankar is going to be talking to us how he sees the world in a post raisi era. General Ravishankar, Namaskar and welcome to P Guru's channel, sir. How are you? Namaskar and thanks a lot, Shreya Ji, for, uh, you know, we are meeting on your channel after a long time. And uh, we are going to talk of something which is pretty important to India. Yes, uh, indeed, sir. And uh, in fact, uh, all this was happening. India had also, also signed a 10-year uh, treaty with Iran on maintaining the Chabahar port and also to use that as a conduit into Central Asia. So there are a lot of things in the mix here. I urge you to take it away. Talk to us how you see this whole thing, where things are going to settle down and uh, how things will be maybe three months from now. Yeah. First, let's take uh, what's happened in Iran. I mean, you know, the whole story. We all know uh, Ibrahim Raisi, who was the president. He met with an accident in an air crash and he's no more. And immediately after that, as per their constitution, in fact, the, uh, you know, foreign minister also, he also passed away. Oh, in this kind of a situation, They've appointed one of the vice presidents, Mr. Mugbeer, as the president, as per their constitution. Right. What is the situation in Iran at this point of time? If we take a step back before Mr. Raisi passed away. Mr. Ali Khamenei, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, he has been the supreme leader of Iran when, ever since he took over from Ayatollah Khamenei. Ayatollah Khamenei was the one who did the revolution in 79. And, you know, replaced the Shah, he came, he died from then, Ali Khamenei took over. Ali Khamenei has prostate cancer and he's in poor health, right? It was rumored, it was spoken that uh, Ibrahim Raisi will succeed him. Okay, be that as it may, so what happens? This man is now no more. They don't have a foreign minister. So they have to have not only a president, but sooner or later, they need a supreme leader also. It's it's two things. So it's a double whammy. But then, how does this they go about? What one needs to know, politically, uh, you know, Iran is a strong state. Constitutionally, it is a strong state. You might not agree with the whole story because it's a theocratic democracy. That's the best way I can uh, you know describe it. Now, what is this theocratic democracy? Very clearly, the theocracy rules. The Ayatollahs rule there. There is a set of clerics who choose the supreme leader. And that supreme leader is the last word in the country. But the day-to-day -day running of the country is run by the president. Now, how is the president elected? The president is elected through a democratic process. In, in this case, within 50 days, they have to you know, have elections which in which people participate and vote and they elect a president. But here comes the catch. Not everyone can stand for the elections. The, those who are allowed to stand for the elections have to be decided by the Grand Council. Now, who is the Grand Council? Grand Council has 12 members. Out of the 12 members, 6 members are nominated by the Ayatollah or the Supreme Leader. The other six members are nominated by the President, who in turn is, was always nominated by the Ayatollah. So the Grand Council is, you know, sort of fixed. So it's the Grand Council who will allow who is to part, uh, take part in the elections or not. And now, based on that, elections are held. So whoever comes through the elections, is a person who is virtually of the theocracy. That is why I said theocratic democracy. And historically, the uh, the voting percentage 
in uh, you know iran elections has been low and there has been unrest against uh, the theocracy and the form of rule in which they have and because a lot of freedoms which are denied to the common people if you remember about three months back we had a case three or four months back i don't remember the date where we had a uh, young girl who died in uh, you know custody masha amini and there were huge riots everything and people came down uh, with a heavy hand the government came down with a heavy hand and scotched the whole situation so that's where uh, things are at this point of time there's you know seemingly at the top the country is stable but there are undercurrents the country is in for a new voting for a president the supreme leader is old now the supreme leader it appears wants to put his son right mustaba mustaba kamanai who is also a cleric in com to contend for the elections and rig the elections of course there are others who are in contention uh the names have not come out the elections have not been declared so we'll see where that goes so internally is uh, the whole process is not unstable but it is uncertain right it is uncertain for the two three things i said the process will go through iran is a strong state nothing is going to happen there is going to be no instability or riots and things like that that won't happen i don't think so uh so what and after all the iranian revolutionary guards council irgc which is they got a strong hand in the whole story there with the ayatollah and it will be ensured that the whole thing goes through well no problems on that but where is the issue tomorrow the streets could go wild as it they did earlier so that's one problem the second issue which could happen which could happen is that okay they get a president and something happens to the uh, ayatollah then who is the supreme leader right and whether that president uh, then aims to become the supreme leader or not what it is so because it's almost two in one kind of a deal there so these are the uncertainties which are there in iran at this point of time but overall i don't see instability and this is across the board everyone whom you speak to will say there's no instability in iran at this point of time and things will go normal okay now let's talk of how iran will continue to behave post elections is there any change in its outlook from the current one no i don't see any change iran will continue to behave the way it behaves it is behaving now which means what it will continue to be anti israel it will continue to be anti american it will continue with its nuclear pursuit there no doubt about it it will continue to support the hezbollah the hamas and the houthis right there will be no let up on that it will continue to form uh, it will continue to supply russia with the arms and ammunition it's giving ammunition and drones it it will continue to increase its ties with uh, uh, china after all they are trying to form a new alliance china russia and uh, um, iran so all this will continue there is no doubt right but because of this uncertainty which is which i have said it's subtle very subtle certain things might not happen in the time frame we are visualizing how the new president how will shape up how will he behave what will be the future of uh, you know ayatollah kamenei we don't know so those uncertainties are there so what i see overall of iran there will be stability there will be continuity but there will be a bit of uncertainty so uh, this is the overall uh, state of iran as i see it it will continue to play its role uh, in the middle east already uh, the acting president mugbeer 
he's reached out to uh, saudi and he's asked saudi prince mohammed crown prince mohammed bin salman to come and visit iran uh, so you know there is some movement on that score uh, though whether it will go through fully or not is to be seen we'll see how it uh, plays out right so that's how it is at this point of time as far as iran is concerned uh, any questions we could have a discussion then i would like to talk a bit on the importance of uh, iran for india and india iran relations uh, so your questions first and then we'll go there yes thank you so much for your opening remarks general ravi shankar and viewers we have a powerpoint presentation that's going to follow soon and that's where we are going to be drilling into the details about india and iran and and uh, one of the things that i want to tell our viewers see there is an underlying discontent about this whole theocratic setup in in iran but it will only flare up once in a while and we still don't know how uh, that has a face and a name just like you know when the shah was being deposed there was a face and a name which was ayatollah khomeini who was held up in france and he he was brought in and then he became the leader of iran and so on and so forth and there was this hostages uh, release and things like that today there is no visible opposition as i see it to iran's the ayatollahs uh, general ravi shankar can you throw a little bit of light on that because this used to be a thriving democracy in the late 50s and then uh, us put its foot in and then it's all gone to hell in a hand basket i'm sorry to say this but that is the truth yeah it was a thriving democracy the whole problem started with one of their prime ministers mosaddegh who was assassinated and then the americans put uh, the shah of iran reza pahlavi and it became some kind of a monarchy which is which is uh, completely backed by the uh, you know americans uh, but then what happened was there was always in the uh, iran a civilizational outlook and a theocratic outlook at the bottom and that uh, you know erupted in 79 when ayatollah khomeini who was then in france came back and started the revolution he overthrew iran by the uh, shah sent him away and then he ruled for some time and he set up this whole story they set up a constitution they set up a code of uh, how to govern the country uh, through the clerics and then he died when he died ali khamenei took over so ali khamenei has been there for quite some time he's been there for over 30 years even more than that in fact and he is given a lot of stability he's over 85 now and like i said he is suffering from prostate cancer we don't he's not in good health but their their clique of clerics and their religious council leaders have given stability to the state have they uh, have they reformed iran no have they allowed any kind of democracy to come in no it's a very controlled democracy have they given freedom to people no and in fact from time to time there have been eruptions on the street and disobedience and riots and all that and the last one like i told you was very recent people get killed and there's no record of that and all that and you know they're pretty brutal about it so they continue in that manner but if you look at it look at the past that presidential system which they put in place to run the story to run the country uh, president raisi he was a protege of uh, the present supreme leader uh, ayatollah khamenei and both of them were in sync and he took over in 21 3 years back and it was he who uh, took the country towards you know china and russia and he started the uh, overt support to the three heads right hezbollah houthis and uh amans and he is the and of course the shia militia in iraq and we had a very clear thing that look uh, in the muslim world iran with its civilizational uh, lineage 
has to be the reigning power. And he drove Iran that way. And he extended Iran's power in the Middle East uh, through, uh, you know, all these militias and the Quds force. They have a Quds force which operates outside Iran. And the Quds force, they say, is a combination of uh, militia and CIA. And they were pretty, op you know, they, they were actually pretty, uh, what shall I say, very well entrenched in Iran, or sorry, in Iraq when the Americans were there, right? And they were operating against the Americans. Uh, and if you remember Qasem Soleimani, Major General Qasem Soleimani who was, uh, you know, assassinated by America, he was very effective. In fact, the Americans feared him. And of course, that you know, it was largely done by Ibrahim Raisi. Then the next thing is Iran has always had nuclear ambitions. And these nuclear ambitions have continued over the past three presidents. Whether it was President Khatami, followed by Amiruddin Najjad, and now Ibrahim Raisi. And they've gone. Uh, the previous presidents wanted to deal with USA. And they had a deal with USA. They had a nuclear agreement with which uh, President Obama authored, right? And that nuclear deal was okay. I mean, fine. But then in come President Trump and who pulls the whole thing out. And then Raisi comes, he says, I couldn't care a damn about the deal. I'm going ahead with my nuclear ambitions. So they've now all, almost, they got a basement bomb the way people talk of it. They have everything what they need. And in any case, with good friendship with Russia and China, they don't need America or it's, you know, okay for doing that. They've gone through punishing sanctions. Uh, President Trump sanctioned them so much that they couldn't sell their oil till the Chinese came because the Chinese got something like what's happening with Russia. So the Chinese take off all the oil of Iran and their economy has... Uh, revived and actually speaking internationally iran is in a sweet spot at this point of time they have a good hold over the middle east and west asia completely right they're now controlling at this point of time they're controlling the strait of hormuz and red sea and a lot of things are in their grip and they have a thriving relationship with russia and china so uh, but like I said, this entire thing will now go a little slow because of uh, uh, Raisi's uh, demise. Uh, so this is where it is as far as the whole thing is concerned. Uh, and that's playing out because you don't see many great statements coming out of Iran against Israel or against what's happening in Gaza. But one, two months down the line, when the new president comes and he stabilizes to some extent, the whole thing might start. So, as far as Israel and America are concerned, there's a slight sliver of chance if they can settle Gaza in the next two, three months. But I don't think that's feasible. So, the Middle East story will continue. So, this is what I had to say about the whole thing. Yeah, uh, any question more? Yeah, sir, before we uh, drill into Iran, India, I just have one last question for you, sir. Uh, when Israel moved into Rafah, which is the, bar, uh, the lowermost city before uh, Egypt kicks in, they found that of 70 tunnels, 50 of them were leading in well into Egypt. So Egypt has all along been saying that, look, we don't have anything to do with the Gazans. And that has been proven untrue. So it, it just makes it com more complicated for Israel because they don't probably know where the remaining hostages are. After all, this whole thing, Israel is even willing to negotiate only because of the hostages, including some bodies. Israel has a big uh, system of how they bury their dead, and even those are considered very valuable. Whatever be the thing, uh, you know, the, I, I see no end in sight. Every time, you know, you try to bestow a legitimacy on an uh, Islamic government, they come and do the same thing, General Ravi Shankar. I'm talking about Sadat Begin oh. Accord. Look, uh, let's be very clear. Uh, I don't think Egypt also knew of these tunnels. That's my view. 
the tunnels have tunnels? come out now no so what if they could be 100 tunnels they even the look all these tunnels were made by israeli cement huh? let's be very clear about it yeah yeah, yeah of course anyway yeah. okay so if israel didn't know how will egypt know and that's desert that's far away right it, it's not it's not a center of civilization out there for egypt to know they might have known that some tunnels but 50 tunnels they also won't know and the hamas was pretty clear and you also have to understand you know israel uh, when egypt forget anwar sadat and all that kind of a thing it's gone through muslim brotherhood there is also a pro- muslim brotherhood problem there israel today is also ha- has its own internal problems uh, please understand that israel has gone through uh, its own arab spring those people who came through the arab spring were thrown out and now cc has taken over so israel is not so stable that you say look you did this they have their own issues the last thing they would have probably wanted is to do anything with palestine and they have never uh, think so i while i might not while you you know let's not color all this because israel itself is in a bad shape uh, sorry egypt is in itself in a very bad shape its economy is down if you look at its economy it's, it's on the dole right now so and what's more you know which the country which is hit most by the red sea route closing israel uh, sorry egypt why the red sea, uh, suez canal traffic has gone down if suez canal traffic goes down is egypt's incomes have gone down so let's not think that egypt is just uh, i either if, i mean it will be wrong to think that egypt is complicit with the palestinians palestinian problem or is it away from the palestinian problem it's all in a shade of gray so so there is a problem both sides right so that's how you look at it if i definitely one thing is for sure everyone talks of supporting the palestinians for their you know whatever they want but no one wants them neither jordan wants them nor lebanon wants them nor egypt egyptians want them right so we ha- this is a very complex problem with no solution and why there'll be no solution because is the way israel has gone about the whole thing with so many people dead it could be 35000 it could be 10000 it could be 5000 but definitely there were so many there are so many civilian deaths which are not warranted right so if they're not warranted leave the morality of the whole story out whether you like it or not they've happened a cold fact now what will that do to the israelis it'll breed generations of palestinians who are against israel that's already happened not one generation more than one generation now a people whom you had a chance after october 7 to bifurcate or you know divide or keep away from hamas are now completely with hamas that is why yesterday day before hamas has fired uh, you know rockets again on tel aviv so that's a problem which will continue i don't see any uh, i don't see any uh, full stop or comma there thank you sir let's take a quick look at india iran relationship and yeah we'll get we have back a powerful to presentation we we'll spent 20 minutes just talking about the preamble let's go no, ahead yeah i think yeah this is the main thing i mean you are all look at this this is president katami with president abdul kalam on the left you see vajpai and general wedge and of naval chief this is republic day 2003 this is the kind of relationship we have had with them you have to understand iran is a very very important country for us and this is the latest photograph a vice president going and paying homage to uh for mr rias raisi this is just about 3 4 days back so if you see through the ages we have a uh, a major connect with iran and we've always been friends in fact around that time in 2003 when president katani came here there were talks on military cooperation between india and iran 
exchange of officers, exchange of facilities, even sale of armament to uh, Iran. And we were one of the biggest buyers of oil. Later, of course, because of till uh, President Trump came in, we were buying their oil. It was only after that we switched off. They're not very happy about it, but they understand our problem. Okay. And that's where it was. We restarted the whole thing. And uh, why do we need Iran? I mean, you got to understand uh, this whole story. Uh, let me tell you, go from here. Yeah, let me start from here. This is the first thing. You look at Chabahar port. It connects by road to Zahedan and from Zahedan to Zaranj and Zaranj on to Delaram. Right? Now, why have I shown this? For long, we've been saying that we want Chabahar port. We've just inked a 10-year agreement with them to run this port and operate this port. Why is this port important to us? It is an entry into the Strait of Hormuz. Of course, Bandar Abbas, which is further to the left, uh, I'll show you. In, yeah, if you see in this, this is Chabahar and then Bandar Abbas to the left. That sticks absolutely slam bang on Strait of Hormuz. Uh, Chabahar lits is a little to the east. But from India to Chabahar to Zahedan to Zaranj to Dalaram is one route into Afghanistan. And our biggest problem for our bridge into Afghanistan is that we Pakistan never allows us. It's never allowed us. Even when we had to send wheat, you know, for uh, them, maybe because there was almost a famine in Afghanistan, Pakistan didn't allow that. So we have had to now push it through Chabahar port, which we have done. Uh, this agreement is uh, earlier, uh, this agreement used to happen you know, every year. Now it's for a 10 year period. Okay. And this is a government to government agreement. And the road, if you see, the road Zaranj to Dalaram is 218 kilometers. Dala, uh, Zaranj is a border town on Iran, uh, Afghanistan border 218 kilometers is something we have constructed you will be surprised it is india which has constructed this road dro in fact i had a friend of mine general nrk babu he went there and got it constructed he stayed there for two years and got it constructed zahedan to zaranj 200 kilometers partially constructed uh, chabahar to zahedan Railway lines underway and road is all. There's an existing road which is being improved. Now, this is a very strategic thing for us because it gives you a reach into Afghanistan. If you look, think back two years back, everyone was talking when the Americans left Afghanistan that Pakistan will now you know, go into Afghanistan, rule Afghanistan and all that. And there was a requirement of India and Iran cooperating, operating this route and having an independent reach into Afghanistan, right? At that time, everyone was saying, oh, India and Iran should become good friends. Yeah, we were never enemies, but for whatever other reasons, the Chabahar port couldn't progress the way it was meant to be progressing. From a long time, we've been building this port. Now, there's yet another thing. <clears throat> we don't have access to, you know, the Central Asian republics. Now, this road, this road is the International North-South uh, trans, uh, Transport Corridor. Right now, it operates in some manner, not in a real this thing, through Bandar Abbas. But Bandar Abbas is heavily booked. So, the alternate is go through Chabahar. So, Chabahar becomes important. And this road, this International North-South uh, Transport Corridor, gives you the access into Central Asian Republics. That's why I've shown you in a bigger map. Right, and that means tremendous things because energy you get you can get energy there uh, from there, either gas or uh, oil. And the Central Asian republics also want to diversify because today their main claims are is China, right? Or we take their thing, go through the Black Sea, and get it through the Black Sea route. That's another route. But the idea is to develop a direct access into Kazakhstan so your energy needs are met. Right. 
when i say kazakhstan the other stans also get through whether it's kyrgyzstan uzbekistan all these people also uh, turkmenistan all the, all of them come in line then of course the issue is we get our uh, a lot of nuclear uh, raw material from kazakhstan and you need to improve your equation with the central asian republics for our own internal purposes and also to balance china out in some manner so again you need the uh, north south transport corridor and for that you need iran so if we think that iran is you know okay the evil empire out there the way it is painted in uh, usa i think we are wrong completely wrong okay then you have to also see the third angle to this whole story this is chabahar versus gwadar everyone says gwadar the big you know port with china the part the tail end of uh, cpc the flagship of cpc and behind this everything will flow from gwadar up pakistan over the kunjara pass nothing has happened it has not taken off it doesn't handle any uh, you know tonnage and just 70 kilometers away is chabahar chabahar has handled about 10 times the tonnage despite not having any facilities right because the facilities behind chabahar have developed that is the road and rail connections to zahedan whereas in gwadar nothing has happened behind that there is no electricity in gwadar right there is no water in gwadar it's only the port which is today fenced away and protected only the chinese operate out there and there's no uh, you know civil movement slowly it likely to become a chinese base and that overland route from you know xinjiang to uh, you know gwadar uh, is a it's just a dream it's not going to happen i mean that's the way i look at it and that is not something i'm telling now i said this 17 years back and the cpc is not running it's in fact it's barely limping it's crawling if i may say that no one is prepared to put money in the project anymore and of course after the chinese people have been shot dead engineers in the dasu dam area twice and then there's been a suicide a bombing in karachi last year if you remember where three chinese died so things are uh, uh, you know pretty bad so gwadar if you see these two the, i i call it the tail of two corridors this chabahar zahedan jaranj dalaram corridor and the in, not so uh, the transport corridor where the poorer cousins once upon a time to cpc but they have prospered the cpc which was the and the gwadar port which is the flagship of the cpc and 50% of the bri is cpc is floundered right so again why is it happened it happened because of iran our equations with iran we have to understand one more thing and this is important you ignore iran at this point of time i put this map of thing why you see china is trying to develop an alternative to the cpc through pakistan through afghanistan right if that happens and they are in talks with it it might it will not happen in all probability if it that happens then what through afghanistan and they'll hit chabahar and there is some chinese presence also in chabahar one of the terminals they are constructing that means from kabul to dalaram they'll come and then they'll use our route which we constructed with our money and that will become part of the cpc it might be not be cpc it might be china afghanistan economic corridor or something so invariably if you don't do something to stop this we would have served the chinese purpose instead of serving our purpose that will be the biggest irony you spent a whole lot of money you spent 85 million dollars to build this road and then you see the chinese goods going up and down and <clears throat> through the cpc or one ang- uh, route of the cpc and the port you operate for the chinese then will you allow it you won't so what that means 
you have to have be good with iran you have to be good with uh, afghanistan right and so the thing uh, comes into thing uh, into perspective and of course unless your relations are good with iran you can't do anything and your relations are good with iran you can you will not be able to limit what iran and china do with each other but you are there and it gives iran a hedge against china uh, we can take the slides off uh, so right now iran is not anybody's fool they'll play a smart game they will go with china but only that far if it doesn't suit iran they will not fall into the china uh, in his trap they'll use india as a hedge they'll use russia as a hedge right we will not discuss the china russia relationship maybe some day we can discuss that and the impact of the new china russia deal and on india and all this this area we could discuss that that's an interesting discussion so there is no way that we can allow uh, our relations with iran to stagnate or go back right what is the reality the reality at this point of time india uh, iran is that our prime minister and raisi had a good equation in fact he was called for republic day okay the last republic day something happened he couldn't come so there was almost an invitation going across to him for the next republic day when the new government comes in right so we have a good equation we've just started the chabahar port so right the un unfulfilled promise of the chabahar port was just starting to happen and when this whole thing has happened it's a good thing that we have our vice president has gone and paid respects and homage to president raisi and whatever happens we need to support iran to come out the second thing people talk of sanctions you know uh, about uh, on india because we are now taken up the thing with chabahar this is i've heard this in a few american news media outlets but the government has said nothing in fact the government has said oh we'll do we'll look at it even for the american government this is a hedge this is a channel of communication it suits america that we are good with iran it suits america that we have a reach into afghanistan through chabahar port it suits america that we control chabahar port you don't control chabahar port tomorrow the chinese come and control chabahar port chabahar port will be chinese and gwadar chinese end of strait of hormuz right so it's good for american interest that we have a good working relationship with iran right so overall iran is a very important player for us for us to stabilize afghanistan we need even to put pressure on pakistan and pakistan needs a lot of pressure once in a while not just standing it wherever it is you you know you need iran so this is the way i look at it and eventually if you if peace has to come about again you need iran our equation with iran will do good to help the situation so this is what i thought i had to put across as far as india and iran are concerned so uh, your any questions i'm prepared to take on yes sir i have one or two questions and then we have questions from yeah. our viewers can you put up the map please yeah 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 same slide yeah the general ravi shankar this project yeah. to link chabahar port with delaram did the yeah. entire thing start at the same time or was there a time difference almost at the same time this was around uh, 2016 17 it was in uh, in fact the zaranj dalaram was being made when ashraf ghani was in uh, you know in chair in fact it started before that uh, much before that uh, the road was built around 2013 14 right 13 14 it was built and chabahar port we've been negotiating since then so this we had this whole thing in in view from a long time only thing is we could not 
operationalize it for many reasons we couldn't put money on the table uh, there were other issues and you know we went slow but that's a problem with all uh, uh, indian projects uh, most of the time we commit and we are not able to deliver this is one of the problems i think which we really have to uh, look into the new government has to look into and this is across the board bipartisan view of the indian government whether it's mr modi or it was mr manmohan singh this is one of our defects which we need to agree or rather we have to realize that we are not very good at executing projects um yeah. thank you sir now when the chawahar port deal was drawn up india was going to help iran update some of its refinery processes because that was also under the sanctions and they really couldn't pump out the crude uh, and india actually helped yeah. that and in exchange india also got some other things from iran like for example for example india could pay for its crude from iran in rupees and then when trump broke that uh, agreement with iran there was another back deal that was signed between india and uh, united states where india could basically draw from saudi arabia uh, united states is crude at about the same terms except the currency changed from rupee to dollar but then india dollar, got yeah. some other deals which is why now you are seeing such a big bonanza india has such a big foreign exchange surplus mainly because of things that we probably don't even know what is happening crude comes in gets refined in 30 days goes back to the place from where crude came in and there is a money that has to be made everybody is making money on that all that is good my question sir is iran as a country other than being an oil exporter what exactly does it have as a market and and uh, in terms of what is it that they can hang their hat on as a product look you have to understand iran like india is a civilizational state they are pretty well educated people they are pretty civilized people and they are pretty intelligent people unlike you know the erstwhile oil sheikhs of the middle east uh iran was always a center of education and so uh, it's like any other center of education it, i mean apart from oil it had everything right and that is why if you see uh america invested in it because controlling iran you would actually control the entire middle east it had a great strategic value right and we are talking look uh, at, at a point of time when iran was almost uh, what almost it was one of the few developed nations of the world civilizationally so every iran has everything going for it oil is a later day by product the whole story of iran would have been different had there not been western in, uh, interference into this uh, area uh, by first installing uh, the shah and then letting later allowing the revolution to happen and then of course that uh, failed attempt at rescuing uh, the hostages you know took them uh, far away from usa right we saw that movie two years back or three years back argo where a few were brought out uh, but that was about all but the larger thing was a failure that was during president carter's time so iran has everything going for it thank you sir let's take some questions from our viewers yeah yeah please 